Paul Anastas. Paul Anastas is a founder of green chemistry. Uh, he served during the Obama administration as an assistant administrator of the EPA for the Office of Research and Development. Um, he is a winner of the Heinz Award. Uh, he is currently the director of the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering at Yale, and along that way has launched four different companies, all of which are, have their basis in the science and potential of green chemistry. So, Paul, welcome. Thanks so much, James. So, Paul, before we dive into the definition of exactly, specifically what green chemistry is, um, I think it's helpful to set the stage for folks in this way. What before green chemistry, if folks aren't practicing green chemistry, um, what's the dynamic? In, in other words, if the society wants or needs a, a product, temp chemists and, and their cohort set out to design it. If they're not thinking in green chemistry terms, traditionally, let's say, more traditionally over the years, what has been prone to happen? Yeah, back in the day, and the whole tradition of chemistry is to create technological miracles. And by miracles, I mean things that can cure disease and increase quality of life, uh, allow us to do computation and travel. So it has always been astounding, except that there's been a real problem with the consequence to humans and to the environment. So when I was first entering the EPA, when I was just a pup years ago, Environmental chemistry meant a bulldozer, a lawsuit. It wasn't about design. So that's why there was so much contamination of our air, water, and land. You know, the, the first administrator of the EPA used to say, when I launched EPA, the people of Colorado wanted to see the mountains again. The people of LA wanted to see each other again. So that was the old days. Yeah, and and we I want to get I want to there's so much wrapped up in that, but I want to come back to in, in specific terms also. And, and correct me if I'm wrong in thinking along these terms, but it's it's without green chemistry that we end up with things like asbestos and lead in our gas and lead in our paint. Am I right? Because that's that's setting out as you said to create things that can do fantastic things in our lives. Lead that can make paint shiny and durable asbestos that had fantastic insulating qualities, but. Yeah, it's basically just doing half the job. So when you define performance narrowly enough, you know, a good paint, a, a, a good fuel, uh, without thinking about what the consequences are to our bodies and the biosphere, then, then yeah, this is exactly what happens. Yeah, we end up with those. Now, so I want to come to, to, so tell us now then, how does green chemistry solve that problem? If, if, we've, if we end up, if we're not thinking in these terms and end up with, you know, lead-based paint, lead in our gasoline, asbestos, a, a long list of products that have proven to not be so good for us or the environment, how does green chemistry help us avoid those problems? So the nice part of it is, is it expands the definition of performance. So it's not enough to have a, a good blue dye. You want a blue dye that doesn't cause cancer, right? You don't want to have a flexible plastic. You want a flexible plastics that is in an endocrine disruptor, right? It's, so it unifies this idea of performance. Okay, terrific. All right, I'm going to give audience. Well, yeah, audience, you're on, folks. Um, we're, we, have a, we have a quiz time. Paul, I'm going to jump to our first quiz here. And I want, I want to, I'm going to pose the quiz and then have you jump in, Paul, to, uh, to, to help me explain some of these things. So audience, folks in the audience, get ready in your chat box. Here's our quiz time. Everyone ready? Here we go. Which household item has already been, been made better? And we'll talk about what I mean by better by green chemistry. Which household item has already been made better <laughs> so someone's tuning in there already. We're going to come back to that answer later. Um, by green chemistry, is it your child's playground, ibuprofen, the common painkiller, or some laundry detergent that you might have in your home? What's the answer? You see number three, 
number three, number two, ibuprofen, laundry detergent, laundry detergent, all of the above. All of the above. Paul, are you participating in this? I am not. I kind of know the answer. Yeah, no, I, I know you do. I thought I thought I saw your old call sign in there. Um, all right. There, oh, is there an all of the above? Marcy, you're so, yes. Oh, so I see the truth is you are all right because it is all of the above. All of these products over the years have been made safer. Uh, and I say better, but I mean better. I, I mean a couple of things. There's there's your health and safety. There's better for the environment, and a few cases better um, also for the for the efficiency and and cost of the manufacturing. Paul, let's go through these. But your your child's playground. What happened there? Oh, the cool thing was that there was this horrendous situation where the overwhelming majority of arsenic that was in commerce was used as a wood preservative for things like playgrounds, swing sets, right? Uh, and this is what just was invented. Arsenic, right? Arsenic. Uh, arsenic, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, as in the deadly poison, arsenic and old lace, that type of thing. <laughs> yeah, so go ahead, sorry. And, and so they came up with a different, different, kind of um, uh, green chemistry alternative, completely eliminated all the arsenic, uh, and it works better. In preserving the wood. Again? In preserving the wood. Exactly, exactly. So this is about higher performance, not compromised performance. Cool. All right. Number two, uh, number two, ibuprofen. What happened there? What changed with ibuprofen? Oh, so in pharmaceuticals generally, historically, you would generate a pound of drug and at the same time generate a ton of waste, a literal ton of waste. And mm -hmm. so what ibuprofen did is figure out a way where you can dramatically lower the amount of waste. It's called atom economy, that every atom that goes into a manufacturing production winds up in the product. So it dramatically improved the atom economy. Excellent, excellent. Now, I had a specific example in mind when I included the number three laundry detergent, but I don't know if you want to comment more broadly um, I'm thinking of our, our the the folks in Oregon, but if there's other if there, if it's more broader answer to the laundry detergent. No, please go ahead. Okay, so I, I know um, folks that out in uh, in Oregon, there's a, a company called Defunkify uh, that arose out of the uh, one of the leading green chemistry labs in the in the world, I suppose, uh, the University of Oregon, um, and they have put the the processes of green chemistry to work to design household cleaners, a number of them, including a laundry detergent, um, all of which, again, arise up from the design level to we want to tackle the stains, we want to get the smell out without bringing anything else into your life that you don't want. So all of the above with the answer. All right, um, audience, do you have any questions? I want to see any any questions in our question box for, doc, for I was about to call him Doc. We'll call you Dr. Anastas this time, just this once. Um, any questions for Paul, folks? Uh, if, if there's not a specific question arising right now, the, what, I, what I would like to do is open it up right now, and we're going to keep doing this throughout the show, to the audience. Uh, I'm gonna, this, is a, um, this is a segment that I am going to call Grill the Expert. <laughs> and it is your chance, audience, to pick an item in your life, uh, anything in your house, in your workplace, wherever it is, and ask Paul has, about it. And the question we're gonna ask him is, has green chemistry already made this product better for the environment, more economical to use, safer for you to use at home or not? And if it could be, what's, if it could be, if it hasn't, what's the potential? So folks in the chat box, get going. Um, PFOA. <laughs> There's a question. All right, so Paul, let's we need to we need to decode that for folks who don't know what PFOA is first, and then if you could answer Esther's question. So James, oh, I have okay. to say we're getting a little bit of reverb. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, I think we're asking about PFO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So PFO OA is the um, known as the what is it? The eternal of the immortal uh, chemicals because they never go away. Uh, and they not only never go away, they're known to have a lot of various health problems. And so one of the questions that we often ask when trying to generate green chemistry solutions is how does nature go about the same function? So things like PFOA are meant to repel water. You know, a lot of stain removers, or I should say water repellents. Um, you take a look at things like the lotus leaf. And what's so wonderful about those is they don't use perfluorinated things like PFOA. They use the structure of the leaf in order to repel water, right? And so how you use those lessons from nature is where most of the green chemistry solutions come from for things like POA. Excellent. And I know Esther even helped you. She, she put in that it's POA in the frying pan. Was it used as the, uh, was it the original uh, non-stick surface also? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. That's exactly right. right. So POA, it's made the, the waterproofing, uh, they addressed it. And, and, and in the terms of the frying pan, um, and its use as a non-stick surface on a frying pan, has that been addressed through green chemistry? Are you able to hear me, Paul? Could you repeat that? Could you repeat really that? that? We're, we're really really now I'm getting the, the, we're getting your record. There you go. Yeah, sorry, we're, we are having some reverb issues. All right. Um, Esther had included frying pan in there. So the, you know, the, the coating in, is that the POFA was the coating in a frying pan. Has that been made better by green chemistry? Yeah, there absolutely are um, green chemistry alternatives. You'll see non PFOA uh, fry pans and, and cookware. Um, as a matter of fact, that's all I own in my house. Excellent. All right. Now, let's see, we have Hanno asked um, iPhone. What, and I think there's probably many answers in here, but in an iPhone or let's say a smartphone broadly, we'll, we'll take it to all the brands. What has changed or has the potential to change through green chemistry in an iPhone or, or a smartphone of any sort? Well, the most interesting thing about the iPhone is that it uses so many uh, elements in the periodic table. It's crazy, about two thirds of the periodic table is in the iPhone, including all of these rare earths, you know, these toxic substances. And so the biggest way that you can improve the iPhone is by stop using all of these uh, rare earths uh, uh, and so if you can possibly uh, figure out ways of simplifying, then you have great improvement. But here's the issue. Green chemistry is doing exactly that. Instead of using these rare elements, you can have combinations of plentiful, earth-abundant elements to carry out the same types of functions. That would be one thing. The second biggest thing is we all know that it's impossible to take apart or repair. Uh, the principle of design for disassembly is one of the most powerful principles of green engineering, uh, which works hand in hand with green chemistry. So I think it's that disassembly and that you know, right to repair is really important. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right, let's go. I want to go to, we're going to go back to quiz time. Thank you, Paul. We're going to come back to your answers, some of your questions, um, audience, uh, in a second here. I want to go to uh, our, our quiz time here. Um, back to the audience, get ready to answer this question. Which of these has been used to design what I might, what you might think of as revolutionary new materials based in green chemistry? Is it 
chicken feathers, chicken poop, or chicken nuggets? Which of these has been used? Poop. Marcy goes for poop, of course. <laughs> Number two, chicken poop. We got a lot of votes for two. Someone's voting feathers, feathers. No chicken nuggets. No one's guessing chicken nuggets as the answer to our green chemistry solutions. Uh, number one, chicken feathers, chicken feathers. All right, Paul, which is the answer? Is it chicken feathers, chicken poop, or chicken nuggets? Well, the one I have to tell you that I love the most is the use of chicken feathers for innovation. There's a great, great green chemist inventor named Richard Wool. And Richard Wool used chicken feathers to do all kinds of things, specifically in uh, nanostructures, the complex nanostructures of, uh, uh, of chicken feathers is so intricate and complex, he made these new materials. And what's wonderful about those tiny little materials is they use them to build big things like um, the blades on wind turbines. The strength was uh, amazing and uh, he was quite an inventor. We lost him a few years ago, but he was the uh, uh, master of chicken feathers. <laughs> and I think, didn't, did I read, there was a leather that came out of it too, right? A synthetic leather, leather-like material that came he, out he of their did, chicken. He did come feather. up with a synthetic leather as well. and. Um, had some partnerships with Nike on those. Wonderful. All right, we've got yeah, a couple of questions. Just as an aside, I have right. to say, James. Yeah. Richard Wool was also invented in of the bubble in Nike Air, uh, in the Nike Air sneakers. Because yeah. he came up with the bubble uh, and he had the patents on that, he was uh, quite, a, quite a comfortable man. Excellent, excellent. And obviously a very creative mind, a very, very creative mind. All right, some questions here. Um, uh, let's see. All right, this is a question from Terry. Given the denigration of facts these days, how is the country accepting green chemistry initiatives during this time? Oh, what a great <laughs> question. Um, you can come out next week and ask Terry a hard question because that was him. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I will look forward to this. Um, uh, yeah, as a, as a scientist, it is difficult to live in a world that doesn't um, always seem to value facts. Um, the, the good news is there's still a lot of thoughtful people to, with, uh, to which truth matters. Um, and the, the tangible, provable truth of... Um, whether things are, are toxic or benign, whether things perform or they don't. And, and so uh, showing, the, showing the reality and, and that in many places where the reality just simply can't be spun for political agendas. Um, uh, I guess you, you just speak to, uh, to, to, to the folks that are able to hear. Yeah. I, I would I would add to that, I guess, and I've pulled up a couple uh, images. These images were taken in, in Paul's lab at Yale, by the way. Um, well, here, you know what? I'm gonna, I'll go to this and I'll go to the, is, what my answer is this, that, uh, and it's not a direct answer to Terry's question, but it's very much related. I, in, in my work in studying and, and, and helping to tell the story of green chemistry over the years, am always struck by the 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 folks that you are bringing up through the system, the the young the you know the students, whether it's in we're seeing it in high school, probably you could argue probably even in grade school, certainly in college and postgraduate work. And so here in Paul's lab, you know we've got some folks who I don't know their ages, but they're pretty young, and I've met all of them, and they're absolutely incredible. They're they're brilliant people coming to this lab with passion and energy and endless creativity. And I think that's being repeated around the world, really, at, at labs and green chemistry places around the world. And so I think that's, I think they are my antidote to the, a lot of the, the yuck that Terry was talking about. I think the other antidote, frankly, is this idea that when you're faced with things like a company able to make ibuprofen with, what is it, a third of the inputs, when you're faced with, 
you know, a company, uh, the economic benefits of, of green chemistry. And, and you put that in front of business people and they, it, it's a very alluring. So I think it can start to overcome some of the nonsense in the world. James, I think you make a really good point. And if I could um, just comment that when I look back and I look at the, the community of green chemistry and all of the achievements of the field of green chemistry, it really is all about um, mentors, colleagues, friends, community. Um, so it, it, what's most rewarding is, is not any particular technology, company, curriculum. It's, it's the people who have made this their life's work. I mean, the leaders who, who did it when folks couldn't pronounce green chemistry. Um, it's just absolutely astounding. And, and they, uh, I am always in awe of the green chemistry community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really, it's really one. Oh, we got some more questions coming in here. Let's see. Uh, um, I'm going to go with, uh, <laughs> here's an interesting one, because uh, Patrick asks, would you change or add to the 12 principles? And for the folks who are watching who don't know that, and I'll bring them up here in a second while Paul's talking, uh, this all started with um, Paul and John Warner and others working on it, but Paul and John Warner published a book called The... the you have it there, right, Paul? Hold it up, would you please? The book? Oh, as a matter of fact, I have a very rare hard copy of... Um, <laughs> the of principle... Green chemistry Theory and Practice, yeah. Theory and practice, which outlined the 12 principles of green chemistry. I'll pull them up. Paul, answer that question. Would you at this point, knowing what you know now, uh, change or add to the 12 principles? Uh, short answer is no. And why do I say that? Because the, the goal of the 12 principles was not to be the, the 12 dictates or the 12 commandments. It was meant to be a systematic design framework across the life cycle of how you go about designing things so that they're um, non-toxic, so that they're renewable rather than depleting, uh, that, they're, that they are not degrading, but they're degradable, all right? So those principles had to achieve one thing, and that was clarity. And people honestly understood them at the at the beginning as individual and distinct and what folks are recognizing now is that it's a cohesive system where these things work together answering the question hold it if i want to design something that's really sustainable how do i go about it and i think that that um, achieved its purpose of acting as uh, something of a compass or a design framework Wonderful. Um, and we won't go through them all here, folks, just for, for time's sake, but I, this is a, um, there are a couple of places you can find a bit, but since we've got Paul on, here's the, the, the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering's website. And you can go, it's, if you type in Yale Green Chemistry, it'll bring you to their page. And on their page, you can find the principles of green chemistry, the principles of green engineering. It's, it's sister and cousin field. Um, uh, and so I, I highly recommend for anyone who's not as familiar to, to check those out. Um, it, it'll speak to everything that Paul's been talking to. Um, let me make sure I mark that as, uh, um, as done. All right, let's see. Um, all right, we've got uh, uh, Marcy asked a question. Marcy, I want to come back to that question in a little bit, if it's all right. Um, f I want to do another little lightning round here, folks, either with myself or the audience. Um, once again, uh, what has changed uh, or what could change based on green chemistry? We've got some props. Let's start with this one. And I'm going to try to hide logos so I don't get sued by anyone. But um, paint. This is a can what? of ordinary household paint. Um, Paul, changed, will change, could change, and how? Okay, we'll start with has changed. Um, as we all knew growing up, the uh, uh, Dutch boy paints was loaded with lead and, and uh, 
a known neurotoxin and and so getting the lead out that's a that's a good thing we also know that a lot of paints were loaded with solvents and vocs you know moving away from those into water-based paints is, is fantastic okay so now what comes next you know one of the principles of green chemistry or the ways of thinking about green chemistry is how do you get all of the function of a product without needing the product itself so what in the world does that mean you know well when you have a a dye you know you want to say how does a peacock make color right is it with dyes and pigments? And say, no, generally speaking, it's by the structure of its feathers and bending light in order to get color. So instead of loading up paints with, with dyes and pigment, can you use this kind of uh, uh, biomimetic approach in order to get that performance? Um, so, uh, so that's one type of thinking that goes into reinventing you know, next generation paint. Excellent, excellent. All right, we have more. And for the audience, just so you know, we're going to be going till about um, twelve fifteen. Hope twelve fifteen, twelve thirty is somewhere in there. Uh, to see how we're see how we're steaming along uh, till then. All right, here's another one because it's it's just a fun word to say. Um, or is it? There we go. Uh, banana. And 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 I'll 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 throw this out. I don't want to mean specifically bananas. This one needs to be eaten soon. Clearly. Um, Let's let's have the banana as a stand-in for foods that are grown to be consumed by the public. So, green chemistry and in, in foods that we eat, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, so when you look at food and agriculture generally, we are able to produce more food per acre than ever in history. But how have we achieved it? With toxic, persistent pesticides fertilizers to get into our groundwater and to our marine systems causing eutrophication. Um, so how do we uh, deal with these things? Some of the great work being done in green chemistry is around pesticides that only go at the target pest rather than a broad spectrum. And, and so uh, it doesn't cause all of the collateral damage to beneficial pests. There's also plenty of non-chemical um, uh, integrated pest management systems. So that's a that's a whole other approach. Uh, in general, we put ten times as much fertilizer on crops that is needed, and so now we are thinking of ways of uh, green chemistry is using ways of drawing the fertilizer to the plants so that you don't put in all of this excess that winds up in the water. But the last point I'd make is that if food waste were a country, it would have the largest um, global greenhouse gas um, burden. Um, I think it's the, the fourth in the world. Uh, so for a nation, it would be fourth in the world for greenhouse gas emissions. So instead of having food waste, instead of having agricultural waste, you can transform this waste into valuable products. Um, uh, we do some of that at the center at Yale with uh, with things like lignin and wood waste. So, one more product, a lightsaber. Can you change? <laughs> Trick question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we'll work on the lightsaber later. But you, you brought up one. Let's let's take it there since you went there, Paul. Um, uh, you mentioned food waste and, and agricultural waste, and that's a wonderful segue to, and you just mentioned that you at Yale, and you, beyond Yale, one of the companies I mentioned. Why don't you talk to us about, so I'll, I'll introduce it for you, I guess, if that's right. Um, Paul, folks, one of the companies he has uh, helped to found and launch into the world is called P2 Science. Um, and they are, as a matter of fact, making product from the agricultural waste, the, the the natural ingredients that you're talking about. Is this where you're taking, is this, am I taking us in the right direction here? Well, sure. Um, uh, so there was a, there's a wonderful person named Patrick Foley uh, who was uh, at the Yale Center and is currently the chief scientist at uh, uh, P2 Science. And one of the wonderful things that he's done, he's built this great collection of technology. 
is how to use uh, products, as he says, from the forest in the field in order to transform them into high value chemicals like flavors and fragrances. And, and so it's a wide portfolio of green chemistry based products and ingredients for personal care, cosmetics, and uh, the technology can and will go even further than that. But there's nothing about uh, these elegant chemicals that means that they have to be toxic. Mm -hmm. It means and that they have to be petroleum based. And you've got a little show to tell there, I think, right, Paul, in terms of P2 science and- Oh, and something it, I think it, was wonderful, uh, yeah. In, in, in terms of the, the immediate world we're living in these days and the, and the needs we're facing with the pandemic, you've got a little show and tell regarding what P2 has developed based in green chemistry. Show us that. That's exactly right. Uh, so when the, this terrible crisis came down with the pandemic and it was clear that there was a shortage of hand sanitizers, P2 Science, let's see if I can show you that. P2 Science yeah. developed this, uh, this hand sanitizer that is um, uh, made from biorenewables. And uh, and I can tell you that right now I am disinfected. <laughs> and it smells so good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, all right, I want to go back to quiz time because this is going to lead us back to where we are now. Um, and I'll just, I'll make this large for a quick sec. Uh, all right, audience, here we go. Let me, let me get it bigger again here. Um, all right. Thanks to green chemistry, you can now enjoy vodka made from what core ingredient? Ready audience? Thanks to green chemistry, you can now enjoy a vodka made from what sort of core ingredient? And Paul can correct me if I'm wrong, but here it is. Hydrogen peroxide, agricultural waste, as we've been talking about, or air. I'll even throw in chicken poop as an option too. <laughs> or as, as the extra credit. Uh, all right, so we have number three, someone saying air, someone saying ag waste, someone else is voting for agricultural waste. Someone else is voting for agricultural waste. So vodka made from what? Hydrogen peroxide, agricultural waste, or air? Paul, what's the true answer here? Well, the true answer is air, air coal. Vodka air coal from water. It, it literally takes, um, the, as a matter of fact, I'm going to do a show and tell a nice box opening. I've never done a box opening video before. But Just don't drink any until the show's over, please. <laughs> that's right. I don't want to break any rules. That's, uh, so this vodka, uh, really driven by some um, beautiful technology of uh, Staff Sheehan, who was uh, at Yale, chemist, a brilliant chemist from Yale. Uh, he uh, developed this process by which you can extract CO2 um, from the air, actually capture it from uh, from different processes, manufacturing process, capture that CO2 and convert it into ethanol, the basis of the, uh, of the vodka. So it is the first carbon negative vodka uh, and, uh, and it's delicious too. <laughs> so you can drink the vodka but, and feel good about it. Yeah, but, but here's the bigger point uh, James, is that you say, oh, well, uh, all the vodka in the world isn't going to solve the CO2 problem <laughs> and the climate change problem. And that is 100% correct, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's the, the, it's the idea of capturing people's imagination for the fact that the science is now able to transform CO2, this great waste problem, into valuable products. Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking that it just needs to be emitted to the air, we can convert it into this, but we can also, more importantly, convert it into large scale materials, chemicals, things that can be used and not go into our atmosphere. That's that's the real purpose of Airco Vodka. That's, that's, um, that's wonderful. And I think you've, Paul, you've tapped on something that I, it's, 
it frankly, it's, I mean, you've, uh, Erico captures it elegantly. I think it's hard to capture sometimes it is that, that inspirational, the, the magic behind it, because it's not, you dive into green chemistry and pretty soon by necessity, you are talking about, you know, the deeper, deeper, the, <laughs> the innermost circles of the, of the industrial system in terms of in tiny little changes that yield massive difference around the world. Um, but you, the, the danger is then you lose the inspirational power for the public. And that, so it's how do you capture the public's imagination around the incredible potential of things that are kind of hard to get your brain around. Um, and I think, I think that vodka is a, a fantastic well, just way to do it. <laughs> and I've got to tell you, the, the biggest thing that breaks my heart is that with all of the success stories, with new science coming out of academia, with all of the great success stories in industry and business using green chemistry, with all of the great stories of new classes and courses in, uh, in universities and high schools, there's still one big thing lacking. And that okay. is green chemistry has not captured the power of story. If you walk mm -hmm. down the street, 99 out of 100 people are not even going to know what green chemistry is, much less what its promise is today, what it can be yeah. demanded today. And until we change that awareness and people know that this is possible today, then uh, we're not going to meet the full power and potential of green chemistry. Yeah, yeah. How do you connect it to people's lives? And that's obviously what I'm hoping to do with this show. And I hope everyone who's watching, who's a, a ringer in green chemistry, you know, I, I'm sure is already is taking that to heart and trying themselves as well to, to connect it to people's daily lives, whether it's a, a banana. <laughs> we didn't cover the ping pong paddle, but we'll, we'll come back to that potentially later. Um, and any other things in, in our lives. Um, I want to, Paul, unless there's something else that you want to mention now, there's something else I want to do here uh, with, um, with, with the, in terms of the, just the power and potential of green chemistry. Um, here we have the, the world, the earth. Uh, where Where's green chemistry happening? You're, you're at Yale. You've you've worked in D.C. We've we've talked about Oregon. Um, there are wonderful folks in in Pittsburgh. There are wonderful folks. We talked about Richard Wool at Delaware. Let's get off off our shores and around the world. Where else is green chemistry happening? It's much more difficult for me to tell you where it's not than where it is. Uh, so the great uh, the great uh, reality is that you've got brilliant people uh, over in um, over in England um, in Germany and France throughout certainly oh well, there we go um, <laughs> Sweden um, I mean uh, Austria the, so then we'll go down into Brazil and Uruguay and Colombia uh, we'll go down the pan-african uh, green chemistry network has been established uh, out of Ethiopia and Uganda and South Africa. Um, one of the one of the great green chemistry centers is um, right in McGill up in Montreal. Uh, uh, one of the one of the largest facilities is down in Australia at Monash University. But I will tell you the the work that's going on at, at in China and in India is at a scale that is uh, astounding. And of course, brilliant work coming out of Japan. So I could go on and on because there's <laughs> my map so, is so many great uh, uh, individuals who are champions like this over in Nottingham and the Max Planck Institute and, and, uh, and others. It's just astounding. So I guess the short answer is this. <laughs> I'm not sure how much the penguins are doing down in Antarctica, but it's close. Well, well, we'll get them involved. But really, I mean, I think that's, again, the exciting thing. And, and having been to a couple of green chemistry conferences and watched you in action around the world is uh, is is the um, – and here Ed Brush is weighing in. Uh, Ed himself, a, a, a wonderful and uh, thoughtful green chemist. Um, Speaking as that is alluded to in our, our map here and circling um, the the work that that Yale has done with the United Nations. Let's let's talk about that for a sec. So, for audience members, if you don't know, um, the, or the 
United Nations and, and the Yale Center for Green Chemistry and Engineering um, have, have done some work together to advance green chemistry on the world. Paul, tell us about that. Yeah, so um, United Nations Industrial Development Organization has uh, uh, funded a large initiative on called the Global Green Chemistry Initiative, which is, has several aspects to it. One is awareness raising um, to get a, a general awareness of green chemistry and what's possible. Or, um, other is developing curriculum to, to teach this. Other is a technology compendium so people know what technologies they can do today. Um, but most importantly, it's working in some of the uh, emerging economies, places like South Africa, Sri Lanka, Serbia, Egypt, Brazil, Colombia. Um, and what we're hoping to do very soon is to uh, uh, take this to the next level of regional networks. Terrific. I'm going to pull up while you're while you're um, the uh, I have the website ready to go here. Uh, so, folks, again, if you're not aware of it, um, this is the it's the UNIDO, of course, being the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Uh, and if you if you Google UNIDO Green Chemistry, you can read about some of that work here on their page. And, and there's some links to some wonderful resources. So, right. All right, Paul, you ready for another question? Always. Oh, and someone's, Kimberly uh, has posted the link in the chat box. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna ask this question. Paul, Professor Anastas, excuse me, I should, the person addressed you as very distinctly as Professor Anastas. Um, in these changing times, do you have any advice for current and future college students on how best to approach virtual learning? How are you personally changing your teaching style to adapt to less hands-on classroom to virtual learning? And I think, Paul, if I could, well, here, answer it, and I want to steer it a little bit. Go ahead. Well, I think it's a great and timely question because what we're seeing is with this remote learning, uh, at, at worst, when it's just watching videos and, and even when it's live, um, we recognize that Going back to the ways of um, lecturing to large lecture halls, it was always bad. It was always <laughs> a bad way to teach, right? And it only gets magnified when it's done via Zoom or some other, uh, some other platform. And what this really brings into focus is the importance of uh, more, more personalized interactions. Um, the, the smaller, the more tu tutorial you can get, the better. The more Socratic you can get, um, the better uh, to have those discussions. Because I'll, I'll often have these conversations with my colleagues at Yale, that if we really think that our job is to pass knowledge from one generation to the next, when knowledge is three clicks away on the web, I mean, we're dinosaurs. So what we really need to do is start having ways of communicating. How do you build connections? How do you understand how systems interrelate? Uh, and, and those are the subtleties that uh, really can only be done with maybe it's small teams, small groups, uh, smaller interactions. But large, large lectures, large classes on Zoom is not what I see as a good long-term future for education. It seems to me there's a related thing here because uh, I, I remember Paul. So for the for in full disclosure, folks, I've, I've done a fair amount of work with Paul over the years, including some work on the, on the United Nations piece with him, um, and just to help support a little bit. And I remember you said at that time that one of the most important lessons for countries around the world, or not lessons, the things that you hope to inspire them with, is the idea that to do green chemistry, you don't need a massive infrastructure. You don't need a, you know, a plant or a facility at the scale of some of the biggest research universities or largest companies in, in a developed nation. You can do it in with the simplest of places, with the simplest of equipment. Um, and I, that echoes with what this person asked. And I don't know if it's what the, he or she meant by it, but for a student at home thinking about green chemistry without access to the lab, it seems to me there's still a lot of thought and, and 
you know, thought basically and creativity that can happen in terms of what can green chemistry do? How can I apply it regardless of the equipment you have available? So that is tremendously true. Uh, and one of the biggest things, uh, and one of the biggest points that I want to make is that to do green chemistry, to advance green chemistry, you don't need to be a chemist. So there's green chemistry inventions and discoveries at the heart of green chemistry. But in order for those to go to scale at the urgency that's necessary, it will need communicators, it will need investors, it will, uh, it will need policymakers, decision makers, wise consumers. So yeah. if you're really interested in sustainable design and advancing sustainability, advancing things like green chemistry, there is definitely a role for you. Wonderful. Um, that's terrific. I want to, let's see, um, the education piece, actually, Paul, that, that brings us full circle almost in, in this story um, because that's an important one. And the, the, the question, of course, was specific learning at home. But if we take it back to wherever a person's learning, and the initial question I, we talked about in terms of green chemistry and you know how we got to products that are harmful for us of the environment because people weren't thinking about not only does it work, but are there consequences I can design out of the darn thing? Um, tell us about what the implications have been and are and will be for that in terms of green chemistry in our educational system. Where is it, where has it not been what have chemistry students not been learning that they should be learning? Yeah, uh, such a great question. So you would think that the people who are charged with making new molecules and materials are also very well aware of whether or not they're going to be toxic. You would think that, right? <laughs> of course you would, because uh, if you're a chef, you don't just say, I want to make a delicious meal. You want to say, I want to make a delicious meal that isn't going to be poisonous, right? <laughs> if, if you're an architect, you, you want to build a beautiful house, but you're also going to build a beautiful house that won't fall down, right? And so, but yet, with chemistry, you make a molecule, but you don't necessarily know about toxicity. Why? Because you've never been taught about toxicity or environmental persistence or environmental hazard. And to be fair, that's because we didn't have the same level of knowledge about toxicity and the molecular basis of toxicity for many years. But now we do. And so what's a shame is still... Oh, can I pause you there for a second? I want to underline this concept. For anyone who's watching who's not familiar with this, I think it's just it's it's an important one. And it's utterly mind blowing to me that this idea that someone going through chemistry who's going to be launched into the world to design products for society has not, as you said, years ago, we didn't know, so that's fine. But now we know, and, it, and in many places is still not required to have toxicity as part of that formal training. Yeah. Okay. I just want to emphasize that because it, it sort of explodes my mind. Now, I really have to take my hat off to uh, 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 an organization called Beyond Benign and Amy Cannon and John Warner that is developing curriculum uh, that introduces this into uh, uh, the curriculum. But it's astounding that in 2020 that the vast majority of chemistry degrees do not require a familiarity with toxicology or green chemistry in general. It is wonderful to, to hail the work of Beyond Benign and universities like, you know, McGill, Carnegie Mellon, Oregon, Nottingham and, and the UK and, and, um, and others. Uh, but it's not systematic and it needs to be. Every yeah. chemist who's going to make a molecule needs to know the consequences of doing that before they start uh, introducing new things into the universe. I think this may be a good way to sort of send us out. Um, and I'll bring it up here. Tell me, tell the crowd about, you're launching something that I know you're rather excited about in terms of getting people, and I'm talking about the periodic table. Um, oh, 
Yeah. In terms of you know getting the public's mind around green chemistry, the potential, what it's related to, where it can take us. Talk to talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, so it was 150th anniversary recently of the periodic table of the elements. And everybody understands that iconic chart. So I wanted to have a metaphor for all of those aspects that are necessary to create a sustainable society. And green chemistry and green engineering is, you know, part of the heart of that, right? It's a, sort of the central piece. You need to invent that new reality that, that changes the material and energy basis of our society and our economy, right? But those inventions alone won't do it. So what are the other aspects or elements that are necessary for, to bring these things to scale uh, within a, a reasonable, urgent time frame. And so collecting up all of these different aspects or elements and then putting them in this framework of a periodic table, that's what the periodic table of green and sustainable chemistry is all about. It's looking not only at the science and engineering, but at the conceptual frameworks the policies, the regulations, the metrics, the tools. Excellent. Now, folks watching this, I, I have it up here, and I'm actually put it on full screen, Paul, so um, you just need to go away for a second here. Uh, there it is. Um, it, it's, it's a really interesting thing. It, it, you know, it, it's it, very creatively done. It's going it, to, you got to, this isn't going to, this look isn't going to do it for you. You're going to have to get your, get your eyeballs on this because I can't do justice to it, but it's, it, on the on the reader's left is humanitarian green chemistry and green engineering in the mid middle um, the system conditions the really specific stuff that that can make it happen and at the end these broad goals the things we're trying to go for in society to to have a, a, a frankly a better tomorrow and all of that is wrapped up in this in this really cool very thoughtful product that Paul and his and his colleagues have put together. Um, and speaking of which, Paul, I want to—I know, um, so we don't just leave them hanging about where where could I possibly get this? But wait, folks, there's more. Um, <laughs> here it is. Uh, if you can go to Amazon, uh, coming up soon. Well, oh, you can buy the Green Chemistry Theory in Practice, uh, still in print, or here it is: uh, the Periodic Table of the Elements of Green and Sustainable Chemistry. You can buy the paperback for thirty dollars or the Kindle version for $1.99. Tell us about the Kindle version, Paul. Oh, um, so somebody asked, you know, why are you charging $1.99 for, uh, for this? And I said, because Amazon wouldn't let me charge $1.98. <laughs> so that is the lowest allowable uh, price that they allowed for, for this. And the same with the print version. So this is just to get this out into as many eyes as easily and cheaply as possible to, uh, to just start conversation, start discussion, start deliberation about how you move toward a sustainable world. Terrific, terrific. So folks, if you're out there again, he's, I don't know if, if you heard, I had a little bit of a delay in his voice, but the, it's $1.99. Um, Amazon wouldn't let him charge any less. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I think, what is it, release date? What is it, Paul? I believe it's May 16th. May 16th? Correct. Okay, so May 16th, that'll be available for to purchase and download um, if you wanna if you wanna get at your hands on that cool document. Um, all right, well let me, I think Paul, I'm gonna just take a quick peek at the questions. Are you good for another few minutes? Great. Okay, and folks, um, any other, we're, 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 we've now hit the hour mark and I'm, I wanna keep this show as close to an hour as I can, but you know, um, no one's, uh, we don't, it's not a, a desperately strict guideline. So I'm gonna, we're gonna do, we'll do one one final question, if that's all right, Paul. Um, sure. Who are your biggest role models in the field? Uh, this is uh, uh, pre-drag or pre-drag, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, that screen name, asked this question. Who are your uh, biggest role models in the field, or let's say that brought you to this, to where you are? Oh, the, the giants uh, whose shoulders I get to stand on are just amazing. Um, Roger Garrett was my mentor uh, at the Environmental Protection Agency. Tremendous visionary. Uh, 
And Roger Garrett was a colleague of a person named Joe Breen. Joe Breen uh, was the, um, the first director of the Green Chemistry Institute. And uh, between the, the two of them, they, they did so much uh, to uh, enable, uh, enable me to, to uh, uh, try and build things. Uh, and uh, you couldn't have better mentors. What's tragically sad is we lost both of them uh, very young. Uh, and so I always look back on them. But there's so many living colleagues that uh, if I started naming them, I'd just get myself in, in trouble. But it's a wonderful community. But the last thing I'll just say is that I am every bit as motivated by the the emerging ideas, the emerging thoughts, you know, young scientists, and uh, as I am by sort of the, uh, the more senior mentors. Uh, and so I, uh, I often say that whenever I'm speaking is that I, my real audience is, uh, is no older than 12 years old, and uh, my youngest uh, audience won't be born for centuries. And so that is what really inspires me. That's what really motivates me is that our, our decisions and our designs needs to be for people who are never going to, um, uh, will never meet. Um, uh, but that's what we need to uh, be thinking of.